Hey, I'm Bill Foote, and this is lecture one of the series, Informing Decisions Using Spreadsheets. Yes, spreadsheets. In the upper left-hand corner is a cover for the book that would support this, and it's on Lean Pub under Decision. And uh, this is just lecture one. So, so let, let's begin by defining what a decision is in the first place. And we're gonna roll through a series of topics. Uh, I'll call this a phrase C. Um, we're going to uh, uh, generate four questions. And, and these, these questions were used um, by a philosopher from quite a long time ago who taught uh, Alexander the Great. His name is Aristotle. And I use Aristotle because what he ended up doing was asking the four questions that get your arms around absolutely anything. You answer those questions, you have a running start to understanding anything. And if you understand something, uh, and then begin to mash your understanding against the reality that you see on the outside of you, you have a chance at making a judgment. And if you can make a judgment, you can say this thing is or it isn't plausibly, then you have a way of jumping off into what we will call a decision. And that's some of the logic that you will find in decisions in general. And all you have to do to understand a decision is look inside a decision you're making right now. The decision just to sit here and listen to me. A process will come out of this. We will, we will uh, view this process directly inside of an example. Like I said, mash it together with reality. And the reality is... Uh, uh, in this case, going to be through the lens of a soy crushing decision. We will look at the soy crushing decision from the point of view of value and choice. And we're actually going to come up with two different ways, two different perspectives, a dialectic, a dialogue. Oh, sometimes between warring factions and any complex organization. Because of that, we're going to then simulate decisions coming out of two uh, seemingly opposed paradigms. That should be great fun. Well, who were the usual suspects? Um, uh, just about every time we make a choice, it's, it's about an alternative. Uh, and the alternative on the bottom there might be just business as usual, the BAU, uh, which is a decision. As a choice, we may buy things, we divest or we invest, we abandon startup or idle, let's say a soy crushing facility, or a course, or the idea of getting up in the morning. <laughs> yes, how many of us abandon that idea on the snooze alarm and hiring and firing? We hire and fire customers, we counsel out employees, of course. Who, whose, whose idea of the business plan is maybe not the same as ours. These are the usual suspects. There's a whole other range. And uh, an immediate exercise is to sit down and look at eight or nine or 10 decision alternatives from practical life, from, from the business you're in, whatever it is. But we always get down to the question of how do we choose? So we're, let, let, let's wrangle decisions. Decisions is the thing in the middle, that, that dark area that we're kind of exploring. And I'm, I'm going to actually mangle Aristotle. His wording is much better than what I can do here. Um, but we're going to start with um, the top arrow. What is it? This is what he calls the formal cause. The form of something, the shape of something, gives us an idea about what it is. 
So we have a vase and, and somebody, somebody has written something called the shape of water. Look that one up. What is the shape of water? Water has no shape. You have to put it into an urn, put it into a pot, a glass to give it shape. And that is exactly what we're going to do with an awful lot of things that we normally do every day, like getting up in the morning, uh, like getting the clipboard out and counting hawks. If you're an environmental engineer on migration to get an idea of how healthy the environment is. Uh, watch the dials on a production process. The formal cause, okay? We're going to do all of these things and we're going to give it form. And we're going to basically define it. That is, what is it? That's the very first question. The second question is, what's in it? That's the content of a decision. What are the terms that are inside every every decision. We're going to take, again, a very practical point of view on that. The efficient cause is probably the entire science of, of understanding something. Uh, where did it come from? Okay. What is the explanation? What is the description? Okay, These are the things that we will get to in order to project into the future what might be plausibly. Okay, the range of different things that, that we might choose, the range of, a, of an expansion of a facility, the range of the places in which we would expand facilities. As an example, where did it come from? And finally, where is it going? That's the final cause. Where is it going? Now, it might be going into our pockets, wealth. That's usually one of the outcomes that we always talk about. And what most accrediting agencies for business schools will say is um, uh, one of the primary reasons why we study business. For example, um, uh, I would offer that uh, that is something along the way. That is not the reason why I am in business, why I have done business. I do it for human flourishing. And we can, we can get into that a little bit more than maybe the ultimate flourishing. And we see this in a lot of um, movements. Uh, the climate change, for example, uh, is beginning to steer organizations away from pure profit to, well, what about the people? What about the planet? Okay, so where is it going? We can expand on that. And here is the why, to increase profits, to attract investors, um, to replace debt slavery with dignified work. Uh, there are companies that are actually engaged in that activity in the rare earth. The, the very thing that is powering uh, uh, computing and satellites and this machine that we're talking into each other with uh, has rare earth in it, and uh, uh, child slavery has been much involved with that. Well, replace that. That might be it. Médecins sans frontières, the uh, uh, doctors without borders, uh, very specifically, um, it's not about increasing profits. When they call themselves a public benefit corporation, they mean they're providing something for the common good. Eliminate, replace, less noxious emissions. These, it, it, you can come up with lots of whys, okay? And you can actually create a hierarchy of those whys. What's the essence is the form, is the uh, uh, formal cause. What is it? And this is a definition, quite literally, to fall down, to cut off. Decidere is to cut off, fall down. Deciduous trees. <laughs> the word decision is in the this in the word deciduous. The leaves fall down. Now that's that's the root. That's the root. Uh, to finally come to a settlement, which puts an end to a discussion about what we're going to do. Somebody raises their hand. 
and they say, enough, basta, it's enough. We're going we're gonna to act now. We're going to choose one thing or the other. That's a decision. And it settles, settles all of the questions. It is the answer to the question in action. Now, we have an answer to the question in making a judgment. That gets us to a point. Are we acting? And when we don't act consistently with our judgments, we can maybe get off the moral compass, for example. And now we're going to execute something. So we're, we're moving it from the realm of thought, very covert, into the realm of action, very overt. That's the formal cause. That's the shape of the decision. What's in it? In it are terms involving people. People are going to go do this. And processes are going to start up. The machine's going to get going. Somebody is actually going to turn, turn that great big valve, the handle on the valve, and stuff will start flowing. Okay. Process technology. All of the technology, all of the things we make are in a decision. Every last bit of it. Regulations are bounded into decisions. Contracts, relationships, and especially markets. If we're talking about the exchange of goods and services uh, as part of decision. All of these are parts of the decision, the material cause. And finally, what's the efficient cause? Where did it all come from? Well, <laughs> I'm an economist by trade. Please don't hold that too much against me. Um, um, as a decision maker, um, uh, I am thinking about the people, the stakeholders in the decision. I then apply a technology to that, and I still end up with stakeholders. We used to say it starts with people and it ends with people. And when you take that kind of perspective, it starts with the machine, ends with the machine. I go like, so what? The machine is the machine, and there is quite a, uh, a stir, almost a row over what is causal inference in artificial intelligence. Uh, to me, that is a oxymoronic uh, expression, an oxymoron. Um, uh, intelligence isn't artificial. There's no intelligence in this machine. It, it simply operates or just, if I turn the switch on. Can it turn its own switch on? Yes, I can program it to do that. Okay. There is, I am the prime mover, if you will, of the machine. Uh, but it has no inherent intelligence. I believe you do. Uh, I wonder if I do at times. Okay. Uh, but that is the process, the sequence, the movement of how it all could happen. So let's get right to an example of the soy complex, as it's typically called. Uh, this is from some work that um, I did with uh, Andrew Foote on behalf of a, of a uh, big four consulting uh, company that was wondering where they were going um, and uh, wanted to talk about uh, churn and um, how many times a decision ends up uh, into a set of obligations that can be traded. Uh, uh, that's, that's getting at something called collateral. Okay, that's, that, that was, uh, I guess, the final cause. And here's the process that we were talking about, the efficient cause. The terms of this are, you, you can see storage on the left, uh, some boxes. The arrows are an understanding of um, producers and traders, uh, as you can see below. Uh, places, uh, CBOT, Chicago Board of Trade, Allianz, uh, a, uh, a trading port with huge warehouses in China. These are all part of the decision. They're the terms of the decision, the material cause, if you will. Uh, soybeans themselves, 
uh, we take soybeans from a farm. A farm is part of it. Um, origin uh, Brazil, out of Sao Paulo, Great Big Plain, uh, northwest of Sao Paulo. Encroaching on the Amazon, another set of issues. If we plant another hectare, what are we doing to the Amazon, which provides wonderful fresh oxygen for us and, and helps to clean the atmosphere of uh, what? Carbon dioxide and monoxide too. The crush is in China. So ship this stuff called beans in a pod to China where it's stored there. And then there's decisions, production decisions about inventory. That inventory starts to flow into the crushing process and then out. Look at look at what comes out. You get basically um, soy meal, which is which is all of the. Uh, you can get soybeans out of it too. SB should be on here. Um, but uh, soy meal is 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 the pot that's often used for fodder, and it's also used in other production processes. And bean oil, which gets refined just like crude oil. They are they actually call it crude crude bean oil um, is a major additive in a number of other processes, mainly food processes. And then there's refined storage, a lot of storage involved here. And the rest of it is about freight, that those, those green lines are all freight decisions. So you, be, you can begin to use the uh, Aristotle four causes, four categories of everything you can ask about anything to get a complete picture, a complete story about this. Now, how you tell the story, that's communications. That's communications. And uh, there are very good ways of telling a story. The usual one is, what's the situation? What's the complication? What are the key questions? And what are your responses to the key questions? That's Barbara Minto, among others, who also comes from an Aristotelian point of view and a Ciceronian point of view. Yes, we have to point back in order to go forward. So here's here's a where did it come from? Uh, just as an example, uh, lots of planning in the left hand uh, 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 bottom left hand corner. There are ships involved, high seas, the Panamax route going through the through the canal, uh, uh, railways getting uh, uh, farm to ship, trucks. It, 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 a lot of it. I'm, I'm emphasizing the the, uh, the freight story here as much which is the connector between different farmers, shippers, stores, crushers, all financed by the banks. Two countries, really three, if you count the Panama Canal, regulators all around the way with their hands out here, sign this document. You can't do this unless you have this permission and so on. And then pirate is a big issue. Yes, yes piracy on the high seas. Big, big issue, big loss, loss for people, loss for um, uh, economies, and all of the technology, all of the technology that enables all of this. Okay. That's the efficient cause. And we're going to do a lot of that. Now, one, one thing I want to um, uh, stress is we're not making decisions with spreadsheets. We are informing decisions. To inform something is to breathe shape into a decision. And the shape we're gonna we're gonna use, the technology we're going to use to give shape is the platform called uh, and 750 million users can't be entirely wrong about this platform, uh, our spreadsheet. And we're gonna do some spreadsheet engineering at the very next uh, lecture. Um, little Greek, altos um, This is Pythagoras saying, uh, we got to be very wary, uh, wary of this. Beware is to be wary. Um, we're going to use um, Aristotle's causality, uh, his because, as some people, I think Peter Kreft says this. Um, uh, don't say Dixit, Pythagoras, yeah, look that up means I'm the authority. Just shut up. Insist. We're done. 
on the authority. You know, no, 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 we're actually going to delve into things, okay? Um, we're not going to take uh, a typical um, Francis Bacon or Isaac Newton approach either. We're, we're actually going to take a whole organism of an organization, of a decision, all of it, and then begin to look at how all of it is partly represented in each of the pieces, each of the stakeholders, each of the freight routes, each of the inventory decisions that are, that are all part of it. You do not have an inventory decision unless you have a production decision. And, and in my world, and I'm sure yours, these things cost money. You have a pricing decision. You can't take any one of these out and dissect it because it's no longer relevant, not sufficient. And it might not be necessary. We have to kind of look at the entire organism as a set of interconnected working parts. And that's Goethe, the great German poet and botanist and scientist and mathematician. Yes, around the end of the uh, 1700s and early into the early 1800s, his contemporary is Beethoven and Gauss, Gauss, the normal curve, and Marquis de Laplace, the probability theory, uh, but they were using the enlightenment view of dissection. That's how you know nature, you dissect it, you look at the pieces. Goethe said, no, if it's a living thing, especially, that model might not work. It might work for atoms, maybe. Oh, maybe some microbes. Well, in the last pandemic and in the future ones, we know that that's not true either. You've got to look at the entire system. And ecology is that kind of a system. Otherwise, we will curtail our capacity to imagine what might be. We've got to be very careful about that with decision-making and modeling. So we're going to consider some questions. How reducible are humans to simple biology, chemistry, even psychology? And this is very important for decision making. Uh, I don't believe we are. Right now, we're not. And we're, what we're doing right now is not reducible. That's why I get up in the morning. I can't we get back to some basics. How social and political is human behavior? That there's politics in every organization. There are other things than stuff coming out of this spreadsheet that we're going to be focusing on in this series. Many, many other things to consider when making a decision. How complex, especially, are the various interactions involved in a decision, especially the unintended consequences of our actions. And then the human technological interface. IBM, in, in selling its uh, many products and services in the 80s, uh, had a great pitch about how that interface has moved. That was the hardware-software interface, human on the software side, machine on the hardware side. I mean, they they uh, were a major uh, commercializer of the digitization of the weaving process, for example. Digital cards, interesting, into business. Again, informing, it's a human being that gets informed. Okay? Decision-making is much more than about outcomes, although we're going to be looking at payoffs all the time, but it's much more than that. It's what we do along the way. The whole is in the fragments. The fragments, if you add them together, are not enough. Okay, so read, read a little poetry there. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> Is it scientific or scientistic? We we will not worship the guy that at the, the altar of science. No, no. It's more than that. It's much more than that. So let's let's take this idea. Um, uh, we are going to make some assumptions. Uh, the only consequence that matters, for example, in uh, the study we're going to do, we're going to curtail it. We're going to assign. 
uh, homo economicus. Yes, uh, be care, be careful with that. We're more than just market relationship. Uh, we're more than consequences, uh, but we are uh, only consequences matter. Oh my God, so be careful with this though. In the model, the future is uncertain and it's variable. So we really have to think about, again, the whole as we pull this together. So how can we arrange something, the formal cause, the shape of it, the way we value a decision, the final cause? How can we include decision alternatives to material cause into the uncertain and variable changing emergent future, the efficient cause? That's the logic we're going to use. And uh, lo and behold, here's one example of that logic. So we're going to look at expansion or contraction, dilation and contraction if you're you're at the eye, at the eye doctor, uh, crushing operations. So we're going to take take beans and crush them. We're going to make oil out of them. Okay, we're going to take pods and grind them up and put them in great big sacks and feed animals with it or whatever. Um, now this is a conventional wisdom. This is called the decision tree. It's a way of thinking. Um, the decision is expand or business as usual. And what it starts with um, are the uh, uh, decision on the left and maps out the two decisions and their costs, minus 40, minus 20. They're often given markers like those, those uh, red balloons. Then we look at the future of possible payoffs. With expansion, oh, we expect a great market. That's, that's the only time we would expand. That will happen 40% of the time and 60% of the time we would get, um, well, you know, not so good market, a narrow crush margin. So the, the outcomes we're looking at here are crush margins, input price minus output, uh, output price minus input price. It's very simple, $100, $20 a bushel, Ooh, I don't know. Anyways, terms matter, terms will matter. We have a wide margin, we have a narrow margin. And we have it with probability, a variable object. So looks like we got everything in it that we wanted. And then on the other side, again, the sequence here, and, and mark down this sequence, it is, it is decision on the left. Then we have the two alternatives. Then we have Many ranges, this could be a continuous range, just using a binary approach here, binomial, yes, interesting, uh, of outcomes associated with this state of the world in which we expand. And we have two possible states, a wide and a narrow. Okay. And down here we have exactly the same thing that mimics it. Okay, It's a very symmetric structure, but we have very different outcomes. We have a much lower wide crush margin. And we have the same very narrow crush margin on the bottom. Okay, 40, 60, still the same split because the world, whether we produce or don't produce, we're going to say the world will, will uh, evolve in the same way. Now that doesn't have to be, okay? Doesn't have to be. We have an $80 move with expansion. We have a $40 move, that's volatility variability. And the decision itself is the maximum of the, of the expected payoff. Well, if you can expect 52 in expansion, 52 minus 40 versus 36, don't expand business as usual, minus 20, you get 16. The decision is don't expand if, if that's your criterion. Here are the calculations that you can look at sometime. Uh, this is available, gonna be made available. Um, uh, publishing this on a, on a YouTube channel. Um, hopefully, hopefully we'll accept it all. And uh, uh, there you will see uh, 
where exactly this will be available. It'll be on, a, on, on my GitHub site, WG Foot, um, probably under book decision, but we'll, we'll uh, play with that. And here, conventional wisdom holds sway. We have the figuring back. The thing I want to point out, though, is when we look at decisions this way, we have made a prior decision that is saying we are committing ourselves forward. No recourse now. You're done. You build it. You you stuck with it till you sell it. I guess, which was another kind of decision. You make the decision first, invest it all at once, then wait and react to the results. Very reactive approach. This is called the decision tree analysis approach, and it has been the standard approach for many, many, many decades. Harvard Business Review article from a long time ago. Look that up. <laughs> However, when you commit forward. The world might not occur that way. You have now exposed yourself to crush margin risk. That in, was that intended? Well, certainly isn't in the model. Here's the other way of doing it. Let's flip the script. This is door number two. It's always good to have different kinds of models in anything, especially decisions. And look at this one. On the left is, again, the decision. Only one balloon. Then we have two different ways in which the world might evolve. One way, high. One way, low. Okay. Now, now, the low way will still cost 20. The high way will, uh, expansion, will still cost 40. And then we combine them. And we say a high, a wide crush margin world versus a narrow crush margin world looks like this. Okay. We're not reacting anymore. We are being very proactive. And the idea here is we're going to choose whether or not to buy an option to expand or wait. Business as usual. Wait. We're not committing forward. And uh, how many of us make decisions like this? Oh, not always a lot. Okay, so the max again. Look at look at the uh, decision rules here, if you will. Um, One hundred minus forty is sixty. The max of that or zero. And the other is twenty minus twenty or zero. It's zero. Zero on the bottom. Sixty on the top. 40% of the time, uh, we would uh, endure a uh, 60, 60% 60 of the time, zero. 24 is greater than zero. That option is in the money. It's valuable. We choose the option. Here's the figuring. Production is now not committed. We have not exposed ourselves to the future. When we looked at the uh, decision tree approach, we discovered latent in the decision a commitment forward exposing us to market dynamics that we have no control over as much as we think we would like. Now we have aligned, as I put at the bottom, a flexible approach. We have aligned valuation and risk analytics inside of our decision. This is key. We've expanded our horizons. Yes, very important. We flipped the script. Okay. Just one number occludes informed judgment. What if? Okay. What if things change? Okay, fine. So here's some ideas about the change. By the way, what is a judgment? What is knowledge? And we're going to keep coming back to that. And we're actually going to evolve a process based upon the way we actually know something. We don't know something unless we have said it is plausibly. That's because we don't know the future. We don't know. We, we could get other data and find something else out. It isn't just about data. It's pure empirical. No, it's the data and our view of the data. Remember the whole looking at the fragments. 
And that's not even the whole. It is making a judgment. And, and once you've made a judgment, you have not towed. You have slid down that down 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 that hill into a decision. You're going to make a decision. They're done. Unless you have other questions, we're going to go ahead, like right now. So again, we go always back to what a decision is. And the two decision paradigms that we came up with, one starts with a decision, goes on to decision alternatives, and then goes on to outcome. And when we flip the script, what did we flip? We flipped, we, we did a very simple move, very simple. We flipped outcomes with alternatives. And now we did not expose ourselves to risk. We prepared for the possibility that things would be different. And now we're going to do one more thing. We're going to simulate all of these. Now, knowledge, my, my view of knowledge is that it's justified true belief. You can, uh, you, there, there are Kantians out there and Wolseyans uh, uh, and, and other people that uh, have a, uh, uh, an anthropology that's very different. Fine, fine, fine. We can, we'll argue about that all day long. And in that argument, we will come to a justified true belief, whether we like it or not. So it's kind of a performative argument. But it's always going to be a compound of data models, priorities, and judgment, always. And the justification is, again, through validation, V and V, we used to call it validation and verification. Valid, validate our models. That's the unobserved piece. Our models are in our head or on a piece of paper. And, the, and observed, we actually can measure the number of hawks and their impact on, on the local economy and then uh, allocate resources. Decision making. Allocate resources to uh, manage a decision. Either keep it the same or buy a, an option for the future. Okay, that's what we do. Otherwise known as inference. Okay, formal, final, material, and efficient causes. And again, we flip the script. Well, yeah, nobody can possibly read this. I get that. Uh, the uh, spreadsheet will be uh, 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 on the GitHub site. But I noticed a couple of things here. I'm using formatting. Uh, I am using uh, something called formula text to document the key calculations. On the left are uh, uh, this is a scratch sheet, by the way. This is not how I actually build my model. I, I start this way, but not how I actually build my models. I will have a set of uh, assumptions in one spreadsheet, a um, uh, 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 set of uh, maybe outcomes in another, a uh, 10,000 simulations in yet another. And then in a, in a final one that we're going to see next, I have, I have the analysis. And we're going to what we're going to ask with this with this analysis, um, uh, and also some notes there and so on. You see, it's nice and neat. Yeah, spreadsheets are great because you can make them nice and neat, but you always, always, always use formatting uh, so that human beings can uh, see what's going on and uh, uh, segmentation. I'm also using you. You can see in here a little bit that I'm also using name range extremely important number one on the list of things to do when you build a spreadsheet name your ranges so you can understand where things are coming from and going to sounds like a decision process yeah it is here's what here's what we come to we have one scenario and we're going to play it ten thousand times over a scenario about how volatile the wide how volatile the narrow how volatile the costs are, that's what we're simulating. And ROA stands for real option analysis, BAU is business as usual, DTA is decision tree analysis. And the question that we're posing here is, um, when DTA tells us, stand fast, commit that forward, by the way, don't expect. Okay, when, when it tells us that, how often in 10,000 times in these simulations would ROA say buy the option to expand? Turns out it's 45% of the time. It's very plausible that DPA and ROA will not mix. You can't, they are at loggerheads. And that's 45% of the time. 
when do they come together? BAU and wait and hold BAU, almost almost a BAU uh, commit. It's not a commit. Wait, 22% of the time, it's pretty rare. It's not rare, but it's less plausible. BAU uh, happens uh, uh, two thirds of the time uh, that we simulate uh, a DTA. Uh, the rest of the time they say expand. So even there, it's more plausible that DTA will always come up with a BAU, but not always. Uncertainty does that to us. Variability, and when we mix them together and allow the spreadsheets logic, the logic is inside the spreadsheet, the logic of the two decision-making paradigms is in the spreadsheet. In those figurings, I simply took those figurings and committed it to a spreadsheet that I can change. Ooh, sounds like an ROA on the spreadsheet, right? Not It's not return on assets, by the way, we're not accounting. Okay. Overall, DTA chooses BAU and ROA chooses the option to expand. We see that right here. 77% of the time, ROA will say, go for it. Buy that option. Okay. And when DTA indicates BAU, ROA is more likely to choose an option to expand. Very interesting. And here we're only looking at trade-offs. I got to say that right out loud. That this is all about trade-offs. The decision maker cannot base her decision on this analysis, only inform her decision. That's all this analysis can do. Don't base it, inform it, give shape to it, don't base it. To base it means to justify it. Now, this is part of the justification process. It isn't the justification. So what have we accomplished in this first round here? We've applied Aristotelian, you put this on the resume, causality to the definition of a decision. We've looked at four fundamental questions. What is it? What are its contents? How do we get here? Where is it going? We've, we've, we've exuded, well, it's oily here, well, bean oil is, um, uh, logic based upon a set of alternatives. I think that's that's my uh, call to uh, end this discussion. And uh, uh, let me make one more point. We are applying logic. Logic is really important here. If and uh, we're going to have to discuss how we can <laughs> make our logic literally fail. But we yielded two different approaches, and this is critical. There are many ways to get answers, and they won't always be the same, uh, the same answers. We have a lot of different paths. And the only thing that seems to constrain decision makers like you and me is time. So I'm going to give you back your time now. This is just the beginning. It's not a base. It is informing decisions. And with that, I thank you very much for your very kind attention.